number of bees. It's implemented as a stack, and in fact, the tree looks very much like a stack. And so, uh, so you can you could literally read the string just by doing a you know, just just by doing a post order traversal of the tree. Context sensitive languages are generally written in a format that looks very similar to uh, to context uh, to context free languages, but the the non terminal symbols, which is to say any symbol that branches off to something else, anything that's not a leaf node, those can also show up on the, the, the both non terminals and uh, and terminals can appear on the left side of a production. But basically, this means that you c you can maintain context within the uh, uh, within the, uh, as the parse is going on. Um, one example of that is, uh, is, is length fields. Um, in an HTTP packet, for instance, you've got, the, you've got a content length header, which must correspond to the actual length of the payload. Um, and then the next step up from that, you've got the recursive languages, which are Turing complete, and this is where we run into the undecidability that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, writing your, writing your languages in a Turing complete if your, language, if your protocol is equivalent to a Turing machine, you probably have given it more power than you need. I mean, there are instances where that is the only language you can write this protocol you want to write in. But when you wind up in that kind of situation, you should usually try to think, well, can I break this up into two context-sensitive languages that achieve what I want? Uh, or is there a way I can bound the power of this somehow so that I don't wind up with an undecidability problem when I'm trying to make sure that I'm parsing this correctly? The reason why undecidability is a problem is because it is literally not possible to tell what a program will do um, on, uh, with a given input unless you run it. That's the only way to know. You can't, you, you can't predict. You don't know if the, if the program is ever going to terminate Examples of languages that are turning complete that shouldn't be. XSLT. That one will break your head, but think about it. All right. So as we were discussing earlier, um, we can look at the internet as a very large composition of languages. So there's this concept in mathematics called closure. If if a class of things is closed under a certain property, then that means that if you apply that property to any one or more entities in the language, or the, in the class rather, the result is still in that class. So when we say that the regular languages are closed under composition, that means that if you compose two regular languages, then the resulting language is also regular. This is also the case for the context-free languages. Um, some of the context-sensitive languages this is also the case for, but only the ones that you can specify with a parsing expression grammar. Um, and I'll talk about those a little bit more later. Um, if you compose two context-sensitive grammars that cannot be modeled with, uh, with a parsing expression grammar, no guarantees. You could very well end up with a Turing-complete language. And of course, if you compose something with a Turing complete language, well, you've got a Turing complete result. Yeah. I mean, one, th one thing we're actively working on right now is trying to define uh, parsing expression grammars for every protocol we can get our hands on. Because we really want to know is the internet decidable or not? And the next step from that, of course, is when you write your RFCs, you include the reference grammar so that the implementers can. See if they're parsing correctly. If they're all building their implementations off the same reference grammar, they're not going to have differences. We'll get more to the uh, sort of attacks that leads to when you don't all work with the same grammar in a bit. But all right, you've yeah. all right. So this also apply this applies not only to people who are designing protocols, but to people who are designing systems that use protocols. And when I say protocol, I don't just mean network protocols. I also mean file formats. Uh, I mean serialization formats, 
anything that can be specified as a language. Anything that, when you're operating with it, it falls into that Alice and Bob communication model. So reading a JPEG file is really no different than the problem of reading incoming network traffic in this way of looking at things. So when, you, when, you're, when you're composing languages of, differ, of different types, languages with different strengths, you will end up with a result that is, uh, that is in the stronger of the classes. So if you're going to compose a regular language in a context-free language, the result will be context-free. Um, and there are some nice formalisms that you, can, that you can use for actually implementing these. Um, my personal favorite at the moment is, uh, is parser combinators, which are, th those came out of Haskell, um, but they've started to appear in other languages as well. Um, they're now available for Scala, Java, Python, and um, F Sharp, which means by extension the rest of .NET. So another thing that we're actively working on is can we take a, uh, can we take a machine readable specification of a grammar and generate uh, and translate that into a bunch of parser combinators that produce a parser that you can then hook into. Um, unfortunately, this is, you're, you're not always going to have the ability to restrict yourself to, uh, to things that compose nicely, but if you can, do it. But this is not a defense talk. This is an attack talk. So, buffer overflows, yawn. One of the things that the approach that we're taking gets us is if we were to look at this, and if it were a defense talk, we would talk about how implementing strict grammar parsing made it so that 90% of buffer overflows would not be reachable by an attacker. You could have them, you could be there, but if the attacker can't inject a payload, then they are not an attack vector. Well, the flip side of that is we can use these techniques to find where there are likely attack vectors. Um, we're examining these protocols and the implementations of them not in search of a specific attack, but in search of simple weaknesses. Can we find automatically or with a tool-assisted methodology the areas in an implementation where when you tap on the wood, it's rotten? And the answer, of course, is yes. There's a number of classic problems. The implementation isn't able to differentiate between data and code. That's the fundamental problem that leads to any kind of injection attack. The recipient thinks that it's, that it's uh, got a safe input and it's parsing it, and somehow something that's supposed to be put in the data only section gets interpreted as code, executed, and potentially bad things happen. The, back to the, the classes of language, SQL is a context free grammar. So actually parsing that to make sure it's context free is trivial. Uh, regular expressions and so forth, of course, are not good enough to stop SQL injections because they only work for sure on regular languages. When you go to a higher complexity, you need a higher complexity parser. Um, not sure where you're going with this slide. So, Another, uh, another place, uh, another interface, uh, another boundary that, uh, that tends to be ripe for, uh, ripe for problems is when you have multiple implementations of the same protocol. This was, th this was what we had a lot of fun with last year between NSS, Crypto API, and, uh, uh, and OpenSSL. Because um, you wind up with a situation where they're not all speaking the same protocol. They're all speaking versions of the same protocol in, in most cases, mutually intelligible dialects. However, if you can wind up with situations where one implementation of the same protocol parses the same input data in a different way than a second implementation of this same protocol parsing the same input data, 
you now have, first of all, proof that they're not identical. And secondly, you've got a point of weakness. The different, we, refer, we refer to this as differential parse tree attacks. We'll have a slide on that later, but this allows you to pinpoint the area where there's likely to be some maneuverability to build an attack. This is where your attack vector is likely to be because you can, you can confuse the recipient by getting, crafting an expression of some sort of payload for this packet so that it means one thing that's safe to the, the one implementation. In our X5 and 9 stuff, we had the problem of, as I mentioned before, OpenSSL pretty much doing things correctly. Parsing, parsing things as they were. We've got our right, string literals here. We've got this null character. Obviously, that's a character. We're going to treat it as such and validate against everything after that. I mean, we're not going to ignore it. The problem, though, was we got special rights based on that, the signing of our CSR. And then we turned around and had a different implementation parse those same parts. They parsed them differently and differently in such a way that it escalated privilege for us. So had, had OpenSSL been doing things as identically but as haphazardly as the browsers, the attacks probably would not have been possible, or most of them. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit unexpected, but if everybody's doing something wrong the same way, then it's actually not as bad. If, 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 one, per, if, if one person is doing things right and everybody else is doing things wrong, then you, then you actually end up using the, you know, you, you end we up- play them off of each yeah, other. You end, yeah, you end, you end up playing them off of each other. And it's not just limited to two different implementations. We found with OpenSSL, particularly with open source projects, but also long-lived commercial projects. You guys are familiar with this. There's, a, there's an implementation for parsing this stuff, but it wasn't written initially in a very generalizable way. So rather than use the existing code, you go and rewrite, uh, rewrite the parsing for it in a more flexible way or tailored more toward your new use case. And you wind up in a situation where, depending on whether the application is called from the command line or from uh, from a library or given a certain switch or whatnot, you can actually access different code paths in the same application that do the same identical thing. And but, if you're really lucky, ways. they do them differently. So you can actually play an implementation off of itself if you call it in a different fashion. Question? Yeah, where we have a 32-bit version, a 64-bit version, yes. and they load in places? Yes, yes. yes. But not just, it's not just differences in overflows, which is always going to be there. But right now, we're dealing with the situation where you can presume that a 64-bit application is aware of modern security techniques. Uh, for instance, a number of the introductions to Vista that um, actually make doing buffer overflows and code injection in that way more difficult with memory randomization and so forth are only on default for the 64-bit because you can assume that they're going to know that. You can't assume that on 32-bit. So often there's, a, there's other differences between what functionality one class of an implementation is going to have. I mean, the, the problem doesn't just exist with uh, the 64-bit versus 32-bit. It's also what compiler, which usually isn't a problem for commercial software, but is de facto a problem with most open source software implementations because you can't always guarantee that every instance is going to be compiled with the same compiler. And of course, as you know, your compiler is going to make a difference on how your code structures are handled. And if you don't actually take precautions to make sure that the compiler doesn't change how you're parsing things, you may wind up with a different parse depending on what compiler options or what compiler. All right, so let's take a closer look at each of these different boundaries. The first one we're going to talk about is the data code boundary. Every injection attack ever 